morning. Welcome back, college students. Um, if, you're, if you just jump back in, this is your first Sunday back. We are so happy you're here. A couple of things. First of all, there's the um, QR code for the Bible app. If you want to follow along with the message, all the notes are there. But do this. Please save it because it will disappear at 12 p.m. So just save it. Make sure you save it. Secondly, um, who doesn't love babies and toddlers, right? Who doesn't love them? Um, and if you do, we have a place for you because we need some help in the area of toddlers and um, kiddos. So if you, in the sense of that room holding um, that, this, I mean, who wouldn't want to hold that child, right? Um, and so if you're interested, we need you at info at timberridgechurch.com. I said this earlier, if I was going to preach one sermon, this would be the sermon that I would preach, all right? But we're not live this service. That's great. So we can interact, okay? Do you want to interact? Thank you. Um, when you hear the word discipleship, what do you think? Teaching. What else? Discipline. What else? Huh? Okay. What else? Grow. Okay. Good job. Um, what's that? Serving. Serving. Any negative words? <laughs> and what I mean by that is that I grew up with a misunderstanding of discipleship. To me, growing up, it was something that I attended or didn't attend. Actually, if I went back and I was really honest in my first discipleship experience growing up, I was about, I don't know, maybe 10 years old. And they lined us all up in Sunday school, and they had pencils. And all we had to do was to be able to list the 27 New Testament books in order, and we would get a pencil. Guess who did not get a pencil that day? I didn't. And that was my first experience with discipleship, kind of. But I grew up in a church, the reason I'm passionate about this is I grew up in a church that, yes, I did come to Jesus in, and I'm so thankful for that. The Word of God was taught, absolutely, but discipleship was not present. Learning how to walk with Jesus was not in a place where it wasn't a place where we learned to do that. It was kind of like this. This morning, I woke up super early. What time did some of y'all wake up this morning? Just shout out what time. 5.30? Any 10 tenors in here at 10 o'clock? Okay, 10.30? Any 10.30? I woke up about 4.45, okay, because I knew it was going to be super cold outside, and we have animals. All right, so I walked down, and, and well, when I went out, we have three dogs, um, at least outside dogs. We have, a, we have two Great Pyrenees, and we have a Great Pyrenees mixed with an Anatolian Shepherd, huge dog. And they always greet me in the morning when I come outside. They're so happy to see me, plus it's their job to protect me from all the evil that I walk around in the dark with all the way down to the barn. But in this morning when I walked, they weren't there, and I was like, okay, maybe it's cold. They're just kind of camping out. Well, a couple of days ago, Christy and I decided, Christy is, Christy's a great idea, brilliant idea. Um, she said, let's just go ahead, we have a barn, and let's just go ahead and fence it, um, fence all the things off that the cows don't need to get to, and we'll just put hay in the barn, and they can stay in the barn, because it's going to be cold. So we did that, and, and so yesterday I went down, last night actually went down and fed the cows in the barn where they would go in and eat, but then something happened this morning. I had no dogs and so when I walked down to the, to the pen, or actually to the barn, and I was walking, these dogs, two of them came running in, in, to meet me. And if you, do you, you know those dogs that are super smart? Our dogs are super smart. And they just, they, they're just proud. They're proud of themselves. It's the way they carry themselves. It's the way they wag their tails. They're running together. They're looking at each other, communicating. They're going to say, and dad is going to be so proud of us. Well, dad wasn't proud of them because of this reason. Because their job is to care for the cows and make sure nothing gets them. But no one, they didn't get the email or the text message that their job wasn't to keep the cows out of the barn last night. <laughs> so the cows were, 
were in the little huddle, cold, and our dogs were super proud. And so there was a miscommunication. And so today when I go home, sometime today, I'll go down with, with um, Ray and Finn. Yes, Star Wars crazies in our life. And, and we, I'll walk down there and I'll talk to them about what they're supposed to do. And, and they'll do it. But there was a miscommunication. And for me, that's what really existed in the word discipleship. The last week, um, what we're doing right now, we're talking about the values that we have here at uh, TRC. And the first one was no, we're gospel-centered. It has to do with Jesus. The second one is growing. We are called to make disciples who make disciples. And so it leads us to the question, what is a disciple? Well, if you look up, if you want to get really, really um, religious, you can go to the Greek and look that it means a learner. That's all it is. And how many learners do we have in the building this morning? Go ahead and raise your hand if you're a learner, okay? And you're like, I don't want to learn anything else. But here's the thing I grew up with. I didn't understand. When somebody said discipleship, I was like, that was one thing for sure. That was a ship I didn't want to catch because it sounded super boring. Because I always connected it to someone standing in front of me, talking over me, and I didn't understand anything, and I wasn't able to ask questions. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not throwing people under the bus in the past part of my life. I think they raised to the point of where someone else helped them. But God has put a lot of cool people in our lives that taught us how to walk with Jesus. And in that, we are responsible for turning that back to others. Now, here's a question too. Do you ever stop being a disciple? What do you think? Do you ever do you ever reach a point in your life with Jesus that you stop becoming a disciple? You you've tapped out, you learned everything. Absolutely not. Look at this. Three and a half years the disciples walked with Jesus. At the very end, Peter denies. So even the moment of graduation, (laughs) I guess you can call the cross graduation, he failed the test. You know what Jesus did? He showed up and he said, you're still in. Not because of your greatness, but because who I am and I believe in you and in your brokenness, Peter, you're going to go out and change the world. So number two leads to the second question. Can I be a Christian without being a disciple? Number three, how do I become a disciple? And number four, how do I take part in making disciples? If you have kids here today, um, we have some amazing people in this building, first and second service, that write the curriculum that go along with the stuff I'm saying up here. And so when they go home today, they're going to have the same definition that I'm about to give you. A disciple is being a person who follows Jesus in every part of their life. And I think it goes on to say in the way they think act, and talk. So that's a disciple. Now, parents, if you're a parent in here, be careful not to use discipline (laughs) in parallels in what they learned this morning. Be careful not to say when you go home and and your kid does what kids do, they fail you, you're not being a very good disciple. Knock, knock, you're not either, mom, but they're not going to say that. But look for opportunities because they're learning the same thing as you. Y'all can have lunch together and talk about this stuff. Jesus, right before he graduated and went back to heaven through the cross and through resurrection, Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says this, Jesus came and told the disciples, I have been given all authority, which is power on heaven and earth. Therefore, go and what? Make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Teach these new disciples to obey all that I command and all the commands I've given you, and be sure of this, I will be with you all the days of my life. So I want to pull out a couple of things, actually three things. Number one, he says, therefore, go and make. So there's action, right? We don't, we don't have to look at that very long to understand that it is action. Action is involved. It's not so much people coming to you. Remember, Jesus went down to the Sea of Galilee and says, hey, guys, fishing, You want to become fishers of men? They're like, sure, let's do it. And they start walking with him. So there's action involved. Number two, take these new disciples and and teaching them to obey. So you're teaching. Teaching is involved. And number three, 
he kind of gives the end all, all the commands that I've given you. So not just some of them, and this is what's important. Don't get caught on the commands, all the commands. What is going on here is him talking about all the commands, but make sure you just don't include the ones you like. Include the ones that are hard, too. We want to stay away from some things, especially as our culture advances. I don't know why we use culture advance in the same word. That's just crazy. But here's the thing. Sometimes as we grow as followers of Jesus, we run across things that are pretty difficult, and we don't run from those. We run to him and help us understand them. So I want to throw something at you. It says, the Jesus who died for our sins to reconnect us to his loving father is now telling us to become disciples. There's got to be something there, right? I mean, if, if Jesus would step out of heaven, come to this planet, mingle amongst sinners like you and I in broken creation because of sin, but then he would say, okay, I'm going to die for you. I'm giving it all up. I'm coming to this planet. I'm going to, I'm going to, re, I'm going to be rejected by my father. I'm going to be in your place and be resurrected. Went through a lot of stuff in 33 years. And in this, now he's telling us to make disciples. If we want to listen to one part of his message, maybe we need to listen to the other part. But we don't need to confuse them because the same love that he uses in telling people, hey, you know what? For God so loved the world, it's the same love that is pointing us to make disciples. And we're going to get to that in just a second. Number two, um, or not yet, why do we have a problem with this? Why do we have a problem with discipleship making? Or, which leads us to the next question. Can I be a Christian without being a disciple? All right. Um, there's this thing on TV today. Um, the, I think it's called the NFL Playoffs, right? And what if I told you, I'm a, I'm a Cowboys fan. I mean, we're never going to have a team as we did back in the glory days, right? With Aikman, Emmett, and Irvin, and, and, and. But what if I told you that I'm a great Cowboys fan, but I kept wearing this shirt as I talked to you about the greatness of how the Cowboys are and how, yes, they are going to win two playoff games, but then they'll run into somebody and they'll get beat, probably in San Francisco, but that's a whole other thing. Um, but wouldn't it confuse you? And I think sometimes we do that. To be able to say that I want to be a Christian without being a disciple is saying you're a Dallas Cowboy fan while wearing a Green Bay Packers jersey. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. And so in that, I want to stay with this question and look at a verse in Acts 11:26b. Now, the book of Acts is called Acts because it was the actions of the early church. It's the Acts. And so Acts 11:26 says this, the disciples were first called or were called Christians first at Antioch. And this word Christian was not a word used so much by followers of Jesus, or it was called the way. That's what they were called back then, the way. It was more a term used by those looking from the outside, a derogatory term saying, you look, you're a Christian. You are a little Christ. You look like Jesus Christ. And so this word was picked up. And it's interesting to note, too, that it combines it. It says the disciples were called Christians first. So they were disciples who were called Christians. So they were seen as one. And so with that, I want to remind you of this. All Christians are disciples, and all disciples are Christians. Wanting one without desiring the other would not make sense saying, okay, look at this. God, I do thank you for allowing your son Jesus to take my place and to pay for my sins. But since I'm going to heaven now, I'm going to live my life the way I want to. It wouldn't make sense. If, if we are, as his child, brought in through the cross of Christ and what Jesus did, the finished work of Jesus, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, then... We are to act like his children. <laughs> and in acting like his children, 1 John reminds us, this is going to be heavy, 
Man, if somebody says, okay, actually my son, he was at school the other day, and I'll brag on him. He says, hey, Dad, um, what, I'm looking for a book of the Bible to read. What book of the Bible should I read? Notice I didn't ask him what class he was in. <laughs> didn't matter. <laughs> I didn't care he's using his phone if he's asking what book of the Bible to read. But that's a whole other thing, and if you have an issue with that, we can talk later. Probably some bad parenting. But anyway. But 1 John, if you're, if, you're, if you're a new Christian and you want to read something pretty cool, read the book of 1 John. The 1 John, 1 John is written so that we'll know we believe, that we have a relationship. It kind of defines it. But it's a, it's a beautiful book. Look at this. 1 John 2, 3, and 4. It says, and we can be sure that we know him if we what? Obey his commands. Now, this is how the Bible works, so be careful with this. You're like, oh, okay, so you're saying that we're saved through works. No, we can't because the Bible doesn't contradict itself because Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says you're saved by grace through faith, and it's not by works unless people will tell how good they are. So we know we're not, we're not saved by works, but we'll, they'll recognize us in the way we follow Jesus. And the way you follow Jesus is living as he did. We'll get there. If someone claims, I know God, or I'm a Christian, but doesn't obey God's commandment, that person is a liar and not living in the truth. That's pretty straight up. It gets better. Verse 5, but those who obey God's word truly show how completely they love him. This is how we know we are living in him. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did, all right? So again, completely showing others we are followers of Jesus, God's children, because we look like Jesus. And you're like, no, I'll never look like Jesus. I know that, neither will I. But at the same time, that's our goal. Why? I'll show you in just a second. How do I become a disciple? Jesus came to them and he said again, therefore go and make disciples, teach these new disciples all the commands. So we become, we become disciples by knowing his commands and by obeying his commands. And I'm, I'm, this, it's all going to come together, I promise, because I'm not, I'm not a teacher, I'm not a very good student for someone who just says, leave it because I say so. I like to take the scriptures and say, okay, hey, this is the reason I believe God is saying this. This is the reason he wants you to become a disciple. Look, if not his, we will obey someone. And what I mean by this, you're like, well, I don't want to obey God's commands. You're obeying someone. What is TikTok telling you? What is Instagram telling you? What is social media telling you? What is the person sitting across from you? I have one word or two words, but I want to use both the words, Stanley Cup. <laughs> How many of us have one? There's not a sin to having a Stanley Cup, not at all. Can I tell you something very, very funny? This is funny. I'm very transparent, and so I show my scars. We're at HEB yesterday. We had to run in because we have our nieces and nephew with us, and so we had to get them some s'mores. Not just s'mores, the s'mores with the chocolate in, and I don't ever get that because the chocolate never melts. It becomes a mess. But anyway, we bought them. And as I was sitting outside, I turned around in my vehicle and there was a purple Stanley cup. It was that one that Ava has, my daughter. And I started to research information about the issue with water shortages and my daughter having a Stanley cup. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, God says, those without sin cast the first stone. Ava, you're not a sinner, but there's what I'm talking and getting to. This idea and this understanding that we will listen to someone and what to wear and how to act, and how to have some type of, of even the vehicles we drive. Some of you have a major you're pursuing right now because you're doing it because somebody else challenged you because that's what they want you to do with your life. And we do it. And so I think it's ironic that we yell and scream and stomp our foot sometimes and says, no, I want to do it my way, but it's never your way. It's someone else's that's telling you. And why do I say that? Because I'm the world's worst at times. And so I'm going to unpack and show you why it's important to obey his commands. Look at the scripture. 
1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3 through um, 5, God's will is for you not uh, for you to be holy, to stay away from sexual sin. Then each of you will control his own body to live in holiness and honor, not in lustful passion like the pagans who do not know God and his ways. This is powerful. This is a powerful scripture. Let me show you what's going on. Paul is writing to a church that has some issues. And what he's saying is, hey, it's very important to understand you're going to follow someone. You're going to follow the world, and be careful not to judge the world. The world's just acting like the what? The world. They don't know Jesus. And so what Paul is doing is saying, hey, we need to look at this, and it's important to look at this for the reason that you're going to listen to someone, so Jesus or God wants you to understand his way versus the pagan way. Standing out, looking different, and we're going to get to that more in just a second. I'm going to fix this microphone. Okay. Um. So God's will, his command is for you to stay away from all sexual sin. Then each of you will control his own body and don't act the way that everyone else is acting in the world. Why would he say that? He's the one that invented SEX. God invented it. Church doesn't talk about it enough. We get uncomfortable and then we wonder why everyone has a corrupted view of it because the church isn't talking about it. A little frustrated with that. Anyway. But here's, here's the situation. If you want a perfect pastor, you're about to be super disappointed. So I had, as a 15-year-old, I had premarital sex. I did. Okay? I did. I didn't know that verse existed, and I was a follower of Jesus. I had no clue. I had no clue. I, I already told you I didn't get the pencil. <laughs> I didn't know I'm in order. I didn't know First Thessalonians existed. But I did get some advice. When it came to premarital sex and those things, this is the advice I received. If you play with fire, you will get burned. That was from a follower of Jesus. If you play with fire, you will get burned. Well, here's the thing. You throw some, like, I don't know, aerosol cans in a match, it's pretty cool. We did that in high school, right? And so I was like, but fire is fun. And then I had my little discipleship group, also known as the locker room in high school. And so I went in there and I was listening to all these people talk about all these experiences they were having. And I was like, okay, I knew in my heart it was wrong. There was conviction. But no one shared with me 1 Thessalonians where it says this, God's will is for you to be holy. See, see, all the time we focus on God telling us not to do things, but before he tells us to abstain from it, he tells us to be what? Holy. And guess what? When you and I are holy, it's better for us. And and I'll keep on going with this. Look, look, God wanted the best for me. First Thessalonians were written because, hey, he knew as the creator of the universe, he knew as a 15-year-old boy there would be burning passion inside of me. But I didn't know that existed. If someone would have asked me a discipleship question when I was 15 and says, why should you not have premarital sex? I said, because you get the girl pregnant. And the reason I say this is to show you something. As we turn on and God wanted the best for me, look at 1 Corinthians 6. This is so good. Don't you know that a man or woman who does that become becomes part of her or his body. The scriptures say the two of them will be like one person. See, no one told me when I would get involved in that stuff that there would be a connection with that girl that would last a long time. And this is what would happen. I packed all this up and, and I put it in a nice little suitcase and I, and I met my wife, Christy, and we got married. And I was like, look at all my stuff I have for you to deal with. 
there was a lot of baggage. So abstaining from sex wasn't about God keeping something good from me. It was about him wanting me to experience it in his perfect way. Now, there's some of you right now that have weight on you. I'm going to look in the back. I'm not looking in any eyes. The Holy Spirit, it's his job to convict, not mine. If you're that person, God forgives. I found forgiveness through Jesus Christ. And I had to make decisions to stay away because it not only affected me, but it affected my family or my marriage, but it also impacted the other person that became one with me. And so, guys, I know sometimes, you, well, there's nothing involved. Yes, there is. I'm a counselor, too. This stuff doesn't play. <laughs> you can try to shut some of these connections off, but you can't. And you're going to say, well, thank goodness that I've never gotten involved in that. Well, but I won't go into it specifically, guys, but also... We live in a world where pornography is up in front. It's in our face. And I want to read something to you. Damon Brown, which is the author of Playboy's greatest covers, says this. It seems so obvious. If we invent a machine, the first thing we're going to do after making a profit is use it to watch porn. By 2025, virtual reality porn should reach at least a billion-dollar business per year. Compared to the NFL, theirs is 1.23 billion, so pretty similar. It says in this, and it's important to educate your kids to go home and have that crazy talk with them. And don't try to pretty it up because the world will not use the words that they use. It's okay. God understands. But look at this. It says teens and young adults, 13 to 24, believe not recycling is worse than viewing pornography. I'm going to continue just for a second because we learn also this. Pornography fuels human trafficking. In 2022, a company named Apple made 99 billion. A company called Human Trafficking made $150 billion. Avoid this stuff because it's going to infiltrate you in every click you and I make, puts the handcuffs on those that are broken in many ways and are abused and used. So don't disconnect what you do here doesn't affect overseas or somewhere else. But whose idea was it? It wasn't my idea, it was God's, right? Because he says this, you should abstain. Why? Because it's not good For you, you are called to be holy. You're called to be other. And here's the thing too, you understand if you're caught up in that world, here's the thing, you know you want to get rid of it because it controls your life. And that's what idols do. Here's another picture talking about discipleship. If you show the picture, body image. Body shaming, this this, this self-image, what the world tells us we should look like. It's, It's difficult on men and women, and especially, I think, women. I'm not a woman, so I don't know. But this is a part about making disciples, being a disciple. Guys, if you're a college girl right now, and if your dad has never told you this, I'm telling you as your dad, 
and we can stop being dad and kid in like 20 seconds, okay? Also males. Psalm 139 says this, you, you, God, you are the one who put me. If you have a Bible today, I would take your Bible and mark out the word me, God doesn't care, and write your name there. You are the one. Ava, I'm going to put your name in there. Is that okay? Thank you. Um, You are the one who put Ava together inside her mother's body. And Ava will praise God because the wonderful way God, you created Ava. Everything you do is marvelous. Of this, I have no doubt. Nothing about me, Ava, is hidden from you. I was secretly woven together out of, my, out of human sight. No one saw Ava made. And the marvelous God that created this, the, the stars, that created the, 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 the strange animals, the, the beauty of creation, the Rockies, is the one who put you together. You have value based upon the creator and his say-so, not what someone has told you on social media. That is discipleship. That's learning to be a disciple because it's hard to move forward as a follower of Jesus when you're suffering from comparison to what someone has showed you is perfect, which it's not. We go on. How do I take part in making disciples? This is what's cool. This is what's cool. Taking part in making disciples is not attending a Bible study, but it can be. Some of my best times of discipleship has been in the most craziest of places. Maybe, maybe you're a follower of Jesus in here today, and I'm going to give this to you. Maybe you're a college student, all right? And you're like, okay, I, I know God has called me to make disciples, and that guy up front will not shut up, and so I'm going to need to do it this week, probably, because of Jesus, not because of him. Um, so how do you do it? Back in the day, when I went to Charlton, First of all, they had a road that ran through Charlton that people almost got killed on every day, but that's not there anymore. So, but they had these things. It was a, it was a, it was a, it's a table. It was a rectangular table, and it had a little ball and it had paddles. You'd hit it back and forth. I don't know if ping pong still exists. We call things pickle. But anyway, <laughs> sometimes maybe you're a ping pong player. Maybe you like lifting weights. Maybe you like shooting. Maybe you like reading. Maybe you. Finding the interest in where you are and inviting someone into it and getting in discussions about Jesus. Sometimes I think that we're not successful. I think people don't think they're successful unless they they pound whoever it is you're discipling with all this information. That's not it. Maybe pick out a verse and over two weeks walk through that verse. Maybe walk through Psalms 139 and says, okay, what does that mean? How, how, do we, how do we live in that today? Don't make it something it's not, but make it something. Because here's the thing. God created you with a like, an ability, a talent. J- ask him one to join. If you're a parent and you have kids, you have teenagers, you have, you have whoever, man, you have to go to these places like Walmart and HEB. Invite one of them with you and get into discussion with it. Maybe, maybe you have lunch every Sunday. Invite someone with you to your house and talk to them a little bit about Jesus and who he is. Don't make discipleship something it's not. Paul says, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Our job as disciples is this, following Jesus and asking others to follow him with us. And you're like, but I'm going to make a mistake. Yes, you are. But when people saw Jesus, did they see his perfection or did they see his compassion? And what I mean by that 
We learn all about Jesus post-cross, post-resurrection. But if you're walking around and you saw Jesus, you're like, oh, look, he's perfect. He never sins. No, we would say, ha he says he no sins. But on Instagram, I saw that picture of him. He sure looked like he was sinning. But that's a whole other story. But here's the thing. If we were walking in the time of Jesus, we would see the difference Jesus was in the culture in which he existed. Instead of saying and calling out people, he was touching people. Instead of avoiding them, he was making traffic pathways through their life and meeting them there. Which reminds me, if you think discipleship is about how much you can gain in your knowledge about Jesus That's not what it's all about. It's about living him out. And remember, Jesus says, Matthew and Matthew, right before he graduates this world and goes back to his father, he says, go and make disciples. Guys, John 13 through 17 was the last week in Jesus's life. And in the last week of his life before the cross, he made an emphasis to tell his disciples, hey, your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. Not how much you know, but how much you live that which you know. We're almost done, but before we do that, can I have a live on this one, please? Um, I'm going to ask Josiah to come up. Um, We just happen to have, um, and I don't know how long it's going to take it to be um, on, but this is Josiah, um, actually Josiah King David, so he carries a very heavy um, biblical name, Um, but... You've been with us this weekend. How long have we been in your life? Uh, so, met John when I was 14, 21 years now. 21 years. Um, and we haven't, I just texted him <laughs> during, after first services, hey, hey, will you, can I ask you questions? I didn't even tell you what questions I was going to ask him. Nope. No, you didn't. But that hasn't changed over the years either, right? Nope. First of all, I asked him before I even got him up here, I said, have I been someone in your life that discipled you? You said yes, because you would have said no, I wouldn't have had you up here, because then we'd have been fake, and that would have been not real, right? Right. Been very awkward. Hey, I discipled you. Not really. I just told you you did. Um, But what did some of that look like? What stands out about discipleship in our time together? And you can be as real as I'm real. (laughs) So when I'm thinking about the discipleship, I think about the times that you and I went places together, whether Mm -hmm. it was just you and me alone or you and me and a couple other guys. But like I remember driving out to Gun Barrel City to see this kid in a youth group that had gotten, um, he was in uh, rehab Mm -hmm. and we almost died on the drive. I remember that. That was pretty funny. And also, um, (laughs) I didn't spill the coffee. Yeah, you didn't spill the coffee though, which was impressive. So. But what some of the, the biggest things that kind of pointed me towards Christ is looking at John's example of how he loved his family, how he loved Jesus first and foremost, should have started with that one, but how he loved Jesus, how he loved his family, and then how he loved others. Um, I was a kid with a messed up upbringing, and he still loved me because of it. The church that I went to actually... John Christie and then some of the kids that I went uh, there with were the was the first church that we didn't kicked out, we didn't get kind of not kicked out of but shunned because of my family's past, and that was I knew then I was like there's something different, and that was one that's just one of many experiences uh, throughout our relationship, um, seeing how you loved. Christy and the kids and how you pursued missions in Haiti and how you pursued growth in your marriage and as a pastor and as a parent, like, and then even seeing the dark side of that to where, like, things get hard. Yeah. Last time y'all were down, yeah. it was hard. Yeah. It, it was, was hard awkwardly time. hard. Yeah. Right? Um, but we continued mm-hmm. the journey. Right. Um, and, and here's the thing, too. Guys, I just didn't disciple him. He discipled me. Um, and, and continue to show up and continue to call. Um, 
And so and now you have an amazing life that's not very good at sequence, but that's a whole other story, um, the game sequence. But um, very, very beautiful family. You have three kids. Your, your life was a train wreck growing up. Um, and God gave you a beautiful wife and three amazing kids. And you're pursuing Jesus today. And now are you making disciples? Yeah. 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 I'd say my disciples first start with my kids now that we have kids. Um, it is my calling to ensure that our kids are stewarded to the throne of God every day through imperfect parenting. When I see, when I mess up, I seek forgiveness from our kids and I show the humility of being able to seek forgiveness in our failures. Um, as far as other friends and family, the next one is in our workplace. I purposefully seek out opportunities to be able to speak about Jesus and um, pray that God gives me the answers to knowing why um, some of the things I do is a little different at work than others. Uh, with friends, uh, we have got a really good friend that lived with us for like six months preparing for his wedding. Uh, and every day that we got a chance, like I would ask him, like, well, how, how's it going? You know, like, what is it? Uh, trying to like dive into their lives, like you're saying. Um, we've lived in community. We're uh, looking for more others in community right now, but in the past we've lived in community for seven years where we would get in each other's mess talking about our failures, where we were messing up as a parent, as a as a husband, as a follower of Christ, and just seeking to make that better because overall we wanted to be pursuers of Christ who through our life, like what Jesus said, shows others Christ. Well, I am thankful that you're in our lives and... Um, course, Candace and the kiddos as equally, um, and uh, we love you. So thank you uh, for teaching me what it is to follow Jesus, too. So get a hug. <laughs> now, now, a funny a funny note, I'm going to go ahead and throw this out there, too, and then we'll finish the message. There's going to be opportunities for college students here for internships in the summer, and I'm just saying that there's a potential that you'll meet your future spouse and an intern at TRC because here's the thing, we went to a camp in New Mexico and we were on a chartered bus taking all these high school kids and stuff and on the way there, they, were, they didn't sit together as interns, but on the way back, they were, you know that love that it's like they don't see anyone else on the bus, so other interns and ourselves were responsible for them. They just sat by each other and talked to each other all the time, and they're married today. So there's hope beyond the internship, you know, if you're looking for that other one. Come talk to them. Um, but as we, thank you, Josiah, for that. So as we close out, I want to say this. The most important part, the first step of becoming a disciple is understanding where you are with Jesus. Just like we said, you cannot separate Christianity and being a Christian and being a disciple. And so how do you become a follower of Jesus? It's recognizing that you're broken. You're a sinner. And the beauty in knowing that you're a sinner is understanding that you have a need. And Jesus met that need in showing his love through Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ answered that call in obedience to his father and stepping in place. So, you know, in many ways, Ava, if you'll come up here for a second. I know, I'm sorry, I'm bringing everybody up today. So come up quickly, come up quickly, quickly, quickly. You don't have to bring your Stanley Cup if you want to do that. Um, so it's like this, you know, um, Ava's sitting here as a sinner. Um, I don't know, do sinner things. Um, I don't know. But, but in this, her being in the sinner, and, and I want you to see this, guys, this picture and get the accurate view of who God is. God doesn't look at her and pour all this guilt on her. He says this, Ava, you have value because you're my creation. I don't, I don't need you because I'm God, but I want you, Ava. In all of your muck and junk and insecurities and wondering who you are and if you're enough, the answer is yes, you are. 
because I declare the final answer. Now, I know, Ava, you have a tendency to listen to some of those rackets on the streets or through your phone, but those are just insecure people talking to. And maybe one day they'll find me. And here's the thing, Ava. I actually want you to show me to them. But first, we have to do some business. And the business is this. I don't have to tell you that there's some things broken in you. It wasn't my plan from the beginning. But I don't make mistakes. I knew how it was going to play out, and I knew what it was going to cost me, and I'm still in the game. And so, Ava, I want you to know this. In your brokenness and insecurity, and even those thoughts about me sometimes that you wonder if it's too far, <laughs> I'm okay. Because a secure God loves the insecure and meets the broken. So, Ava, this is what I want you to think about. It's done. Your sins are paid for. The only thing you have to do is accept. And me, my son, speaking existence from nothing, dying on the cross, my son for you, and being resurrected. He's coming back, but he's standing at the door and knocking. I'm an all-powerful, all-loving God that cannot mix with sin, but I'm standing knocking. I'm not going to bust the door down, but I want you to answer. And when we answer, thank you, Ava, when we answer, we don't have to answer with all the right questions. We answer with surrender. God, you are God. I am broken. And really, God, I don't know how in the world you could love me because no one has ever loved me before. Even my dad left me. How could you love me even when my earthly dad couldn't even hang out with me? Must have been something I'd done wrong. But he doesn't play with me. In your brokenness, he stood in the path of freedom. And so becoming a disciple first is surrendering to the gospel and the good news that Jesus died for you Jesus defeated sin. And because of that, we have hope. Guys, after the service, there's going to be people up here with tags on that would love to pray with you. If there's some stuff, I brought up some heavy stuff today. We have a room here that we can take people to and talk with them. We have counselors, LPC counselors that love Jesus up here and willing to talk. You just have to make availability. God, I, I thank you for this moment. I thank you, Father, for who you are. God, I pray that as people heard your word today, God, that they didn't get a mixed message of this idea that you're concerned with when people are down to kick them. That's not you, God. Because if that was you, that doesn't really make sense of what you did through the cross. And so right now, I pray that those people who may not know you will surrender their life right now, giving up their way and acknowledging who Jesus you are to them. God, and let them know that we're here, not as ones that have the answer, but you've revealed the answers to us and some of the things that we have been broken from and in. Not as one that has it figured out, but one that understands how you work even through the brokenness of our world and our, our sin. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for checking out Timberridge Church on YouTube. We pray that you enjoyed this message. If you want to get caught up on the current series, click right here. If you want to see any previous series that we've done in the past, click right here. And also make sure to subscribe and hit that notification button so you don't miss out on any of the content that we post here on Timberry Church's YouTube account. We will see you next time.